Hello guys and welcome to the second video of our uh, series this off season which is not the summer <laughs> as you already know and uh, today we are going or tonight or where, where, whenever you watch this uh, we are going to take a look at uh, the 2014-2015 seasons like in the previous video we are going back around six years in time and to take a look at what happened in the season right after the draft uh, which we looked at last week so this is pretty standard already in, in our off-season series but this time I've included also the trades in, in, uh, in this video and I will not go into that much details into the trade but just mention some, some of the bigger ones and this means that likely the video will be somewhat longer but I hope not too long so to start we are going to first look at uh, what's, uh, what's like difference <coughs> uh, in this season not in uh, com competition wise but more or less organization and rules uh, as far as uh, the rules changes and similar stuff <coughs> go and what, what happened that was different to other seasons and uh oops sorry and the first thing uh, is that in in the off season we voted to bump up the entry fee which naturally um, in, means that we bumped up also the price pool by uh 50 percent from 50 uh from 50 bucks per 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 gm to 75 and the, we also increased the number of teams that get a share of the pot uh, from four previously to seven and uh, this was not uh, i don't remember the vote count but i think it was pretty uh, well supported i think around 15 players uh, owners voted in favor and I think our current structure is uh, has been in place since then and it's a, it's a good one, it's a bit more spread out so like one third of the teams uh, get a share of the, uh, of the winnings so it's, I think it's a fair, a fair uh, structure and the next thing is another uh, thing very close to my heart uh, the sheets came to be in this off season and it was like it says here a surprise turn of events because it's it happens or it, it began with a simple message board post to to ask about the arrangements about the live auction draft or if we want to do a message board draft instead because the live auction like we talked uh, about it last season had its uh, downsides at the time because it had to be organized in another uh, shallow uh, not shallow but uh, shadow like league of uh, um, of ourselves shell league i don't know what i'm trying to say but uh, anyway it had some downside so people started discussing uh, if they if they want to keep the live auction or go to a message board and i was okay with uh, keeping the live auction and Frankly, I was firmly uh, against uh, firmly against having a message board draft uh, because it's for me it totally defeats the idea of the auction because it's not a live auction when you have it on the uh, on the message board. But here, uh, <laughs> randomly or not as random as the previous random fact, but uh, Max was. Uh, against both uh, proposals and uh, <laughs> he even got a, a bit ranty about the uh, the spreadsheet here where we discussed it and maybe he, he should uh, trade for Rantanen it maybe uh, like fits fits the, the character mode but uh, respect to Max for uh, actually dealing with uh, the fact that majority supported things that he he didn't support and uh, stick with it and has always been one of the well, well respected i think managers of the league so that's uh, like a side note uh but back to the sheet story so because i was heavily against the message board draft and i suggested 
to have a dedicated spreadsheet and then mm, Jay got on board and Kyle. So we were like, even I called us on the, the message board, the spreadsheet coalition and things got actually pretty developed pretty quickly. I think over like a couple of days, maybe a week, we had a, a working uh, spreadsheet that people could test and I would say basically one by one or a bunch of it at a time we won over the uh, the other owners to the sheet site and we actually did uh, it didn't do any like a dry we did a test but we didn't have any introduction period we jumped right did it and the the actual 2014 auction was held uh, in the sheet i'm sorry but you know <coughs> you know that this uh, i always go on the tangent when we hit this topic and i love i love the sheet i think it's great and unique uh and uh, thanks again to i like i like always to all of you who supported the idea and whom especially to jay and uh, later to andrew who actually made it made it happen so to to <laughs> just to, to summarize what i've been talking here is that uh like i'm all, almost 40 and uh, uh i one of my like proudest moment of my life is coming up with the idea about this and then working together with others to make it into this. And I, I, I don't know if this is just weird or flat out pathetic, but I'll let you decide on it. So anyway, back to other topics and uh, going from one of the, for me at least, uh, biggest or more, most positive moments in the league to one of the most negative also for me, but I think also for others. Uh, this is the season when the uh, the f the first like uh, mm, I don't know uh, stir up happened around uh, safe benching players. Uh, for you, for those of you who weren't around then, safe was the the first manager, first owner of the Quebec, uh, Quebec, Quebec, Quebec. Oof. <laughs> Quebec Ramparts franchise and uh, I won't go into details uh, about what exactly happened but the fact was that uh, we pretty much turned into this uh, collectively I think and the atmosphere was not uh, not really uh, great uh, and it was I can say for me the only time I've considered uh, I've considered quitting the league and because it wasn't much fun to be around. Uh, and I think the whole league was co pretty close to breaking down. But I'm mentioning this not before because I want to go into details, but because this was a thing of a pivotal moment or in the start of a period of change for the league, which saw a change of um, in league management change in owners and change in also many other things like rules and uh, other league mechanics and especially speaking from my current point of view and position in brackets uh, i really hope uh, m most of you will share my my view that these changes were uh, for the better or at least for the most part for the better. We cannot go for 100% <laughs> efficiency. So anyway, that's done. I'm done with this topic. We on to something more fun. And we will talk about the trades first before we take a look at what actually happened in the regular season and in the playoffs. Because trades were spread out across the season, but uh, uh, many of them affected teams throughout the season so that's why I think it's good to to talk about them now and this is not going to be like the biggest or I think ah, I remember these are actually chronological so this is not from the smallest to the biggest 
but uh, they are chronological. So the first trade, which is this one, was actually the first to happen, I think, in the off season. So to confirm <coughs> what uh, Greg posted, I think, in the WhatsApp chat, uh, yeah, he could have been more patient with his 2014 draft picks. That would have benefited his uh, his team likely, because here he he trades away one of the one of his uh, top selections in D1 Larkin in the off season or before they started playing the season, and he got back Brent Burns and Jeff Skinner. So this obviously was a trade for the Blazers to go for it now because they traded away two prospects in the first round and some and some uh, roster player. <coughs> roster players and the first round pick uh, in 2015 uh, turned out to be uh, Mikko Rantanen uh, which is quite a hefty price to pay for Brent Burns and Skinner and I think I don't remember if Brent Burns was a pure rental or he had one more year but still it's, uh, it's a big price and next on the list uh, is a uh, is a trade uh, where I, I included this because it was curious that two of the two of the later late first round busts or we can if you call them that were swapped quite soon after the draft uh, took place so if obviously the mighty camels or Clint uh, were high on Ho Sang at the time so they traded for him and gave away Hendrik Sedin who at the time was still uh, towards the end of his prime but still a very very good player and obviously with Tyler Ennis and Ho Sang uh, it was a trade that you, we can call a win for the Vipers uh, not only for now and but for the future because at least Barbashev developed into a, an NHLer the next trade here is between the Ramparts and my team, the Steelers. Uh, I think I was saved by the fact that Sprong didn't didn't really pan out as a prospect. Otherwise, it would have likely been worse at looking back at that trade. Uh, but I liked, I think, Pavelski was a top contributor and he was like right up until two years ago still one but uh, I don't want to go on a, another tangent but Joe Morrow here first I was quite pissed when Pittsburgh drafted him because I wanted them to draft Brandon Sad, who was a local kid from the Pittsburgh area and Pittsburgh could have always used some good wingers to play with with Crosby or Malkin and instead they drafted Joe Morrow who, who busted out and here I traded for him and he busted out on my fantasy team too so I was doubly mad at him so I don't remember this trade fondly although I think I got Buchnevich back later in another trade and then I traded him away again so uh, we had a little bit of love and hate uh, going between my team and Buchnevich, not unlike Jay. Here, the next trade is interesting because it's not technically a three-way trade, but it's uh, a trade in which uh, the Patriots acquired Malkin from the Turtles and then the next day they traded him away to the Ghost. So basically I summarized these two trades, in, two trades into one three-way trade. And you see, at the time, Mark, the the owner of the Upper Canada team, he was definitely the trading uh, king of the league, at least in terms of number of trades he, he made. But if you look at this one, he obviously pulled also some very good ones for his team because <coughs> not only he got decent players for the present, but he also got a bunch of future assets including uh, Varensky, who is really a good fantasy asset. I don't know if this was a pick that actually was done by the Patriots, but still it was <coughs> it was Varensky who was picked with this particular selection. 
and uh, the girls and uh, the turtles got uh, some help da down the middle and the turtles were obviously going for it this year this particular season as you will see in the standings in a few minutes and the last trade which is actually a trade deadline trade includes brand burns again so again the blazers are involved and uh, uh, brad here is shopping for his run as a top team and the blazers have basically turned uh, around to acquiring or turned back to acquiring some futures so if we consider jvr and skinner to be of comparable value so basically the blazers uh, traded away Larkin, Alex Tuck and a first rounder and got back Lekkonen, Barber and another first rounder and Tyler Myers, yes, we, see, he was still under contract so I think it was a bit of a downgrade but still with Provorov, Provorov uh, they, they got some decent value at least to help uh, their blue line for years to come I think he still plays there I mean for the Blazers and with that uh, we're done looking at the big trades or some some of the biggest trades and how did the regular season go so this is directly the standings from the from the end of the regular season and uh, you see you see some some highlights here uh, Lin Shuping was the top team and uh, actually not only them but all four uh, division champions from previous from the previous year retained their uh, their title and uh, interesting with I found that quite surprising that Sparta and uh, Wolfsburg basically swapped spot places from the previous uh, standing so uh, I think Sparta went from 16 to fourth, and uh, Wolfsburg went from 50 from fifth to 17th. But the Norris was so competitive that the margin of error was really slim. And towards the playoff cutoff line, it was pretty interesting. And uh, I don't think there ha there has been another time when there was a three-way tie that actually was split by the playoff line. And in that case, uh, the ghosts uh, were the unlucky ones as they were beaten on the tiebreaker of uh, wins over ties. So the win, the more wins uh, you have, the, the better you place. And Atlanta and Kansas City edged out the ghosts uh, for the final playoff spots. And Dubai uh, missed the playoffs. So and I have added here some to to add some context to these uh, to these words. Here are the main contributors for uh, the top two teams, and as you see, these are some some top heavy teams and a lot of uh, multi cat contributors on those teams like Ben Simmons, and uh, for the Turtles you have Ovechkin who is who has always been a beast. And Lucic when he still was a beast and Bufflin too. So these were really strong teams. And uh, Dubai Oaks also had a decent team, but uh, with maybe one exception. But uh, they, it just comes to show that you cannot get as lucky every season like they had the playoff uh, run the previous year. So this is just like fate uh, getting back at them. And uh, the, the Aces down, they had a pretty uh, bad team and uh, he, they, they actually had Crosby still from the uh, original veteran draft. But uh, this is Crosby's reaction when he saw that the second best scorer on the Aces was uh, David Dearne. And, <laughs> and this was not even because the Aces traded away assets at the deadline. They were just bad all season and on to some other uh, notes from the season but mostly from the NHL stats uh, it was a down year scoring wise or at least uh, individually for the uh, NHL because Jamie Benn led the league with 87 points I think 
in most years since then we had 100 point scorers uh, but this was a really an maybe exception to the future years of course Ovechkin still got 50 goals and there was still a 20 uh, to 200 penalty minutes guy and this was this piece uh, I couldn't stand really the f even when the Pittsburgh Pittsburgh signed him it was even worse but anyway move on uh, and like we saw on the for the top team two teams uh, there were a lot more multi cats uh, studs guys who put up not only points but also were playing special teams were hitting and were taking uh, a lot of penalty minutes so we saw on the top two teams uh, Ben, Simmons, Lucic, Ovechkin, Bufflin and here I've put David Backes because he was really an amazing player in our league for a long time because not only he did all those things but he was also excellent in the face of circle so he in, and he blocked quite a few shots so he was like the ultimate uh, versatile forward for for our league and I would say he will, he was quite underestimated or mm, might have been by my, by most of us so what happened in the playoffs uh, the like we saw who qualified in the last side so this is how the rounds first round um, unfolded so the so-called wild card wild card round as we if we call it that uh, and uh, here uh, mostly upsets if you can call it that because these teams were pretty, pretty close in terms of um, of points in the standings the scouts won over the Warriors the Blazers uh, demolished Atlanta uh, the Steelers needed a tiebreaker to get over the ice dice and the Royals beat the Tigers in what was uh, actually a rematch of their first round meeting from a, a season ago but this time the Royals managed to win uh, over the Tigers and in the second round unlike the previous season where there were a lot of upsets this time the division champions basically romp and stomp so <laughs> when I saw these results I thought uh, of these uh, movie scenes where it, where the David Jones says there are no survivors so basically there were there was no mercy by the division leaders and they all won convincingly so the top four teams were set to meet in the semis and this year were is where some of the upsets of this year's playoffs came as the third and fourth place seeds upset the top two seeds and we already looked at the main contributors for the Lin Shopin team and the, the Turtles and these were the guys who led the Jackalopes and the Ramparts and I can tell you that both of these teams I think were not as top heavy or not as multi-cat heavy as the the other two teams in the semis but these were pretty deep and on both sides there were at least three or four other guys I could have put there I like I remember uh, Tatar I think for the Jackalopes who who was having a very good season but uh, doesn't show up here <coughs> because they were pretty deep so it was a sign or maybe at least this season that the uh, depth better depth in the playoffs uh, is uh, maybe more vital and also another thing that I have been thinking throughout the years that when we come to the playoffs and we play 1v1 so it doesn't matter if you win by by 11 to 3 or by uh, 7 and a half to 6 and a half then you can you can basically win only by having better offensive categories and <coughs> sorry and you see here for example the Jackalopes team they don't have many uh, grit uh, or multi-cat players but their scoring made them uh, good enough to for deep playoff run 
And at the end, in the playoffs, the Ramparts uh, win the championship 8-6. to six. And it was not, again, without some controversy. So this is what has mm, was been su- not supporting, but going with the Ramparts throughout this season and also a bit uh, over the next few seasons. But still the Ramparts win and this is their first title. Uh, the Jackalopes did well uh, in the final, but ultimately they were the second best team in the playoffs on that season. So that pretty much concludes our review of the what happened six years ago in the league. And looking ahead, I have at least one more video coming up. No, one which Brad would uh, would like. I think he likes all of them, but this I think he would like particularly. Uh, that I think I'm going to be ready with over the next 10 days. And I really hope by then we have some something to look forward to in terms of NHL news and uh, something to start structuring our season around. So we need to schedule our auction. We need to think to see what our uh, regular season uh, schedule would look like and and really get back to business. And for the meantime, uh, as of tonight, our country is going into a so-called soft lockdown and all sport events are on hold. So I really hope this is not what happens across in North America because I am starting to really miss hockey, actual hockey, not only talking about hockey. So hopefully you're all doing well and uh, see you around. Okay, bye bye.